us today our featured speaker, Mr. Richard Wilshire. He's a British expat, an information security management consultant who currently lives in Orange County. Fortunately for us, because he brought his beautiful airplane over from there. Um, he has a passion for aviation since he was very young. Asthma kept him out of the Royal Air Force and even considering a career as an airline pilot. However, since he moved to the United States in 1999, he began a course of flight instruction and eventually obtained his private pilot's license at John Wayne Airport in 2001. Since that time, he's qualified in ta tailwheel formation and aerobatic piloting. Today, he's got over 350 hours flying his chipmunk. Oh, I'm sorry, not 350. 1,350 flight hours total, mostly tailwheel, and 525, I didn't mean to short you, <laughs> flying his de Havilland chipmunk and chipmunks. I'm told we are absolutely not to take anything he has to say following this seriously, but trust me, folks, I would if I were you. Won't you please welcome our featured speaker, Mr. Richard Wilson. So I'm going to start talking about the origins of the chipmunk. Um, in October 1945, the Second World War was coming to an end. The war in Europe had ended. The war in the Far East was coming to an end, uh, I think, probably in November, wasn't it? And uh, in the UK, they happened to realise that their Tiger Moth, which had been the trainer of most of the British Commonwealth countries, certainly, um, was becoming a bit old. It was 15 years old. Uh, they wanted to build a replacement for it. It was getting definitely long in the tooth. This is an example here is a DH-82C. It's not a C for Canada, although this is a Canadian version. It's a C because there was a B before it and before the... Well, you've worked that out. <laughs> um, the thing about this is that... Uh, let me see now. There we go. The Canadians put a cabin on it because it's cold up there. Um, it, so it was designed as a, a two open cockpit aeroplane. They also put a tail wheel on it because it was originally built with a skid, and in the UK in particular, operating on grass, it gave it enough drag to be able to slow down and didn't need brakes. Well, now it's got a wheel to the normal on, so then the brakes are going slow. Thank you, Dan. That's the H2 dash 2, I think. Oh, there it is. Yep. Okay, so. You have at the time, the UK was busy with the design of the Venom and the Vampire Express jet uh, fighters. Um, because it's a Canadian tribute, they were trying to keep a Canadian theme here, so you'll see that this actually is, if I can work this out, it actually is a Royal Canadian Air Force Venom. The engine in this is the De Havilland Goblin. It was previously known as the H1. And the reason it was known as the H1 is that it was designed by a guy called Frank Halford. I want you to remember that, please. De Havilland was also building the Dart, which was the king air of the day, the executive transport. Um, I guess this must be, in Canada, two clues. One is it's got a Canadian registration, and the second is snow on the ground. Although, it could have been here yesterday almost. And the third thing is that they were building this, which was the uh, world's first jet airline with the DH 106 Comet. Again, uh, this is a Royal Canadian Air Force example, it's a Comet 1X. Um, and the Royal Canadian Air Force was actually the first air force in the world to have jet transports. And I'm to say that my first flight ever in Chipmunk, uh, not in this Chipmunk, but in my own one at the same time it used to work was. Uh, given to me by a guy who used to fly these rocket ones. So that's, that's a little bit of a connection with history. So, faced with this design problem of, you know, we want to build a replacement for Tiger Moth, we're so busy here, what do we do? Then they thought back, well back in 1928, one of the guys in the boardroom pulled out his iPad, opened up Fall Flight and said, hey look, 3,099 nautical miles away, there's a place called Down to you, let's build ourselves a factory there. So that's what they did. They established it happened in Canada in 1928. The bit about the iPad could be a fable, I'm not sure. And in 1945, they were actually building mosquitoes. In fact, this particular uh, mosquito here is one that was restored in New Zealand, first flew in 2012, and is now at um, Virginia Beach with uh, Jerry Yagan's museum. The guy flying it is Dave Phillips, one of the most understated um, pilots you'll ever meet for the stuff he's flown. 
Um, but you know, I just think it's great that this aircraft actually was rolling down the production line down to in 1945. There's another shot of it, just look at that lovely tail. That's the Avalon tail for you. So in charge of the uh, production of these mosquitoes was this guy here, who's their chief engineer, that's uh, Vesevola Yakimiuk. And I don't have to say that again, all right? I've been practicing all night long, I didn't sleep. So he was in charge of um, basically the design as well, of a couple of ideas that they had at the time. They wanted to build a bush plane, they wanted to build a trainer, they actually had some models. And uh, in October 45, on a visit from the UK by one of the directors, he saw the model of uh, you know, what they wanted or had been kind of thinking about building. Knowing the problem they had in the UK, this is what he said to them. You can make a good trainer, I will sell it. And that kicked off the Havilland Canada's uh, indigenous production line. That, was, that set off the chipmunk. So what did they design? Um, well, first of all, it's an ab initio trainer. That's a fancy word the Brits use when they mean just from the beginning. Or in the US parlance, to be a primary trainer, a PT. So it's a single engine, two seat tandem cabin monoplane. So if everyone will agree, I hope that it's a single engine. Um, you can't legally, in the UK, you can get three people in the chipmunk if one of them is in the back and under three years of age. But basically, it's a two seat aeroplane. Um, it's tandem in that the seats are one in front of the other, not side by side. And that's, that is not always the case with military trainers, but it's typically the case with a military trainer. Um, it's a cabin monoplane, they wanted to put, sorry, it's a cabin plane, they wanted to put a cabin on there and avoid having those horrible, cold, chilly, open cockpits. And it's a monoplane, it has a single wing, unlike the steering that you'll see flying around and one in the hangar today, which have two wings of biplanes. So that's essentially the characteristics of the design. It is semi monocoque construction, which means that the metal, especially on the fuselage, actually shares some of the load of the plane when it's uh, in the air, and indeed, I guess, on the ground. So the load is entirely taken by the framework with something like, say, a fabric covering. The metal there helps take the load and helps make the plane overall a bit lighter. Um, it's also cantilevered on the main plane, in other words, a big wing, uh, on the arch, which is another fancy word for the vertical and horizontal tail surfaces, on the alighting gear and on the axles. What that means is, when it's cantilevered, it is self-supporting. So if you look at the beaver as it taxes in there, it's got a high wing, but it's got struts supporting the wing. So that is not a cantilevered structure. Everything about the chipmunk here is just one piece. One piece of wing, nothing supporting the tail at all. The helix comes straight out the wing, the axis comes straight out the bottom of, of the helix. So that's it. It's very clean in that regard. The power plant on the production aircraft is the uh, inverted inline four cylinder Gypsy Major. Um, and, and both uh, this aircraft here, which is owned by Greg Finch, who's hiding there, uh, and my own, both powered by a 145 horsepower engine. Uh, because it's upside down, it does have a tendency to lose a little bit of oil, uh, hence it's known as the Dripsy Major. <laughs> and what's really interesting is that the chicken was not built in response to any specific requirement or specification from any armed force or any government. De Havilland simply said, we need to do something to replace the Tiger Moth and there's thousands of them, so there must be a market for a thousand chickens. And this is the model that uh, they were sporting back in '45. What's interesting about this is that the, the core of this airframe is the section from behind the engine house, which is the front of the, the, the forward fuselage section, the firewall, to just behind the cockpit. And this is what it looks like. And you've got these two U-shaped frames which carry the loads through. And if I go on and just expand a little here, you can see these, the thicker circles are the two mounting points for the main wings bolts about that thick on each of them and then just for rigidity as much as anything else because they, they can extract to the main spar which is the, the low carrying part of the wing and then it's forward that little circle there is a bolt about that big that's what keeps these wings on 
I try not to think about it when I'm flying. <laughs> so the Gypsy Major, remember him? So in the 1920s, early 1920s, Frank Halford took um, a Renault V8, took four cylinders off one bank of it, built a crankcase, put the cylinders on top, and that engine became the Hamilton Cirrus. So the company that built those was actually using ex-World War I surplus. So the Renault engine that started this engine off was ex-World War I. And, and we're still flying them, aren't we? <laughs> so originally it was a four-cylinder upright engine. It was developed and became called the Gypsy. And this is coming slowly because that's all they can do, this thing. <laughs> this is a Jehavan 60 Gypsy Moth. And that is a gypsy engine. And what you'll notice is that this here is, is the line of cylinders on top of the engine. So the pilot's there, he's got four cylinders in front of him, he's got heat, smoke, probably a bit of oil, and he can't see a darn thing. What do you do to fix that? Well, by the way, does anybody know which particular gypsy moth this is? Anybody seen out of Africa? That's the one. So what do you do to fix it? Come on, audience participation time. Yeah. Thank you, yes, you invert it. Now, the problem is, if you just invert it, sorry, if you don't invert it, you're gonna to have to drop it down, and that means you're gonna to have to reduce the prop diameter. So yeah, you have to invert it. The problem is then, you're leaving an engine which is gonna have oil draining into the pistons, and that's when it comes to drips in Asia. But you're right, that's what you do. So the Gypsy 2 became the Gypsy Major 1. They inverted it and called it the Gypsy Major. It was 130 horsepower at the time. And that's what one looks like. That's actually from the De Havilland Museum in the UK. It's a Gypsy Major Mark 8. You can see all that oil collected stuff hanging on the bottom of it. So key specifications, since it's Canada today, we're going to do it in proper numbers, metric. So it's 10.46 meters, span, and 7.75 meters length, with a nice thing is, in imperial numbers, it's 34, 4, and 25, 5. That's easy to remember, if anybody asks you. Yeah. 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 The max speed is 120 knots, that is 40 miles an hour. Yeah. 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 The max speed is 120 knots, that is full throttle, flat, at sea level. Um, few of us will fly at that speed uh, at any, for any length of time. Typically they cruise at 90, 95 knots. Um, when I came in here yesterday, I was cruising at about 95 and I had a 30 knot tailwind, which is quite a significant difference, but it means when I go home, I better pack sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> the knot exceed speed is interesting. This is the speed at which they think it might fall apart. So when it was in the Royal Air Force, um, WB833 over here had a knot exceed, a VNE, of 173 knots. When they went onto the civilian register, um, I'm put to use by those feeble civilians who don't have the hardcore training that military types have, they pulled it back to 153 knots. That aircraft is actually on a standard certificate under the FAA here, and the FAA on their standard certificate say, do whatever the Brits did on their standard certificate. Oh, but take another 10 knots off. So I'm restricted to 143 knots max speed in that plane. But I can tell you, I can only get up to 140 if I'm nose down at 2,500 feet per minute descent rate. And I, I've done it just to kind of prove the point. But they did dive test into 240 knots, so I'm, I'm feeling fairly comfortable about it. 15,800 is the surface ceiling, although the highest a chipmunk has ever been is 25,500 feet, and that was with a gypsy major 50 on the front, and that was just a test, uh, test specimen. And the range, 550 to 740 kilometers. It depends whether you've got the small tanks or the large tanks in the wing, uh, either 18 or 24 imperial gallon capacity. Um, that's 300 or 400 nautical miles. But that's virtually to dry. I would never do that. Um, when I'm planning, I look at two things: a 200 mile distance or a two hour duration. Maybe two hours 15 if I've got lots of airfields or I can jump to if the fuel's getting particularly low. But, uh, I've never flown a 300 uh, mile leg, and I need one heck of a tailwind if I were to. So the first flight, May the 22nd, 1946, uh, a guy called Pat Fillingham, a uh, very famous British test pilot, was sent over by the Havilland 
they wanted him to be the first one to fly because they didn't have anybody down in Canada who, was, who had experience of first flight in a new time. So this is filling them, and if you look carefully, you can actually see four people peering in there trying to tell you what they think you ought to do. <laughs> I was going to make a sexy thing, aren't they? Come on. This is filling them flying the uh, prototype CFPIOX. This is clearly not on the, on the day of that first life, because for one thing, it's got no headset on. And we know he was just flying with a headset just now. So this is just a little PR shot. But when he got back from that first flight, he told them, you've got a winner. He didn't want anything changed immediately. And in fact, the next day when they made the second flight, it was a press demonstration flight. That was their, their level of confidence. So production of this aircraft. Um, Canadian design, initially built in Canada, um, but five samples, examples of the aircraft type, went to the UK for test and development there. Um, and in fact, this is the prototype being packed and shipped to the UK. I've got one more picture of this plane coming up in a while, but bear that in mind. Royal Canadian Air Force initially took three, um, and they used those just for uh, sort of um, sort of courier, small transport, moving people around, not really as a trainer. But they later went on and took 120 types out of 217 which uh, the Canadian production line produced. Most of the others went either to the Egyptian Air Force or to the um, Indian government. Meanwhile, in the UK, they went into production and the uh, Air Ministry took 740 total, used predominantly by the Royal Air Force but also by the Royal Navy and the Army Air Corps. A total exactly of a thousand were built in the UK. Now, aficionados might point out that the last one built had a construction number 1014 and that's because there was a gap elsewhere in production where a contract was ordered and those 14 ships never ever actually got numbered and built. So it's exactly a thousand. Ten of those built in the UK went to the Force Area Portuguese, so that's the, I'll translate for you, it's the Portuguese Air Force. And uh, they took ten and then they took one of them apart and put together jigs and built 60 themselves. I know it's just 66 to go with it. They built 60 themselves. And then because of attrition, they built an additional six. So the entire production of the jet goes from 1946 in Canada to the last ship that was built in 1961 in Portugal. So, total of 76 with the Portuguese Air Force. And just to save you the hard of the dick, that's the answer. Also flown by a lot of other military operators, um, the C by Belgium says they only had two Canadian aircraft, they evaluated it and ended up going for um, a, uh, a, an indigenous sort of their own called the Stomp, which looks very much like a tiger moth, which I think is a bit classically replacing the chipmunk with a plane that looks like the plane it was replacing. Oh, well. um, if there's an asterisk, it says that country received both Canadian and British production chipmunks. Everyone else with no symbol there at all received exclusively British chipmunks. Of course, the Portuguese got both as well, Portuguese and British. But the reason there's that obelisk, the, the dagger symbol by Portugal and United Kingdom, is that to this day, chipmunks continue in service in those countries. In the UK, four ships are used in the heritage flights to train, you know, they, they get a, a dumb jet jockey, sorry guys, they get a dumb jet jockey who doesn't know what his feet are for, and they put him in a tail wheel plane and he'll be off the runway in seconds. So this is where they teach these guys how to fly a tail wheel airplane before they let them loose in things like Spitfires, Hurricanes, Swordfish, uh, Sea Furies. In Portugal, they're actually still using them as ab initio trainers. They've got six aircraft still in service. They've brought them back into service and they're still using them, but they have got like only in them. Actually, let me just go back there. One other thing. So remember, it's a 1,283 total production, of which 1,249 went to military or governmental operators. So very few initially went into the civil sector. So that's essentially the first phase of the chipmunk's life. We'll come on to the second couple of stages soon, but 
Flying characteristics. First of all, um, who's flown a jet liner? I know two of you have on this. Come on. Three, four, five. Excellent. Who would say it isn't a delight to fly? No hands go up, of course, but maybe you anyway. It's, it is, it's a delight to fly. Every time I give people a ride, you, look, you get out, look in the back seat, and they're sitting there with a silly grin on their face. It's just sheer fun. Uh, the controls are, they're not at all sloppy, but they're easy, they're light, they're well harmonized, so you know, you don't have to push a lot in one direction, but a little tweak in the other thing to get a reaction. It's very evenly balanced. Um, and typically, you know, if I'm just flying along and going somewhere, I'll have uh, two fingers on a thumb just resting on, on the stick. That's all it takes. Now, there are factors you want to get a grip because you want to be sure that you're doing the right thing at the right time, uh, not letting the plane get away from you. But really quite an easy plane to fly. Some say it's a hard plane to fly well, but I think most planes are hard to fly really well. Um, it's fully aerobatic. I think the numbers plus minus point six is correct and minus three. Um, but it, I pass out at four and a half G, so it doesn't really matter, I'm never going to get there. It doesn't have an inverted fuel system. So when you do get the thing upside down, the engine tends to fall to even go quiet on you. Um, it can get people a little worried, as long as you've got enough height, you can get the nose down to the windmill and start again. Don't panic, yeah. So let's talk about the survivors of chipmunks. This brings us into the, the second phase of its life, I guess. A lot of aircraft were demobilized out of the, the forces, and a lot of them went to flight schools and flying clubs. Uh, a huge number in Australia, actually, as well as in the UK. Um, and at the time, there were uh, some foreign exchange restrictions, which in the UK certainly stopped people importing aircraft from outside the UK. But then, when those restrictions were lifted, Cessna and Piper started making inroads into the UK because they had planes which were actually cheaper to run. Um, and so the chipmunks then began to get phased out of flight schools. Um, became then a relatively cheap personal aeroplane to have. So what have we got? We've got a lot of planes imported into the USA, both out of Canada and out of the UK as the RAF or the, the Ministry of Defence that had then become, came to uh, release them. And then when you get one of these in private hands, it's, you've got to make a big decision. Is it stock or shock? Do you keep the stock engine and those lovely lines of, of, of that cowling, or do you go and put something in it like uh, a Lycone or a Continental? And this sort of conversation will divide a hangar full of uh, chipmunk pilots instantly. <laughs> they really well, you know, it's, it, it, it's what I call genteel fratricide. You know, we, we love each other, we love our chipmunks, but don't talk about putting a, a wonky engine in it. So, you, you guess, you know, it's a bit like being in politics, isn't it? You know where I stand on this. Keep them stock, I say, but lots of people do put um, wonky engines in them, as I very uh, nastily call them. So, you can get them on a stamp certificate here in the US, though most do not. Um, globally, probably 500 still in existence, a fair number of those in museums, very scattered museums. You can go to uh, Thailand and find them in museums. Uh, there are actually a couple in Iran, I wouldn't suggest you go there to look at them just now, but there are a couple there, um, and lots in um, Australia, New Zealand, UK, US, Canada in particular. Uh, and many of them flying in many, many uh, European countries as well. So about 400 still airworthy globally. And if people can just stop crashing them, which they do from time to time, um, the population of flying chipmunks is actually likely to grow because there are a number of them which are uh, either being held to be restored or in restoration at the moment. And just a few samples of, of these. Um, this is number 11 off the Canadian line. It's one of the five that was sent to the UK. This airplane's never ever had any registration other than this GAKE, and even though it did for uh, 10 years go back to and fly in Canada. Uh, it's now back in the UK, and it's, it's a absolutely superb example. Um, here's a nice trio, echelon of three in Australia, uh, where they are, I think at the moment there are 60 flying in Australia, there are 40 in New Zealand, which actually makes New Zealand, this is a useless fact, New Zealand is the highest number of chipmunks per capita in the world. <laughs> and okay, I've knocked all those planes with the wonky engines, but this is owned by a friend of ours up in uh, Maryland, it's got an IO540 on the front, um, I think it looks quite exotic. 
There's, there are so many changes to this plane, it's gone away from looking exactly like a chipmunk. It's taken three uh, ribs out of the wings, made it a shorter span, the ailerons are longer, obviously a substantial difference to the rudder, and actually a very elegantly cowled engine. Um, it's great when you do aerobatics because you've got a constant speed prop and an inverted fuel system, so it just keeps dragging around and around and around. Um, but the funny thing is, it flies just like a chipmunk. It's a lovely plane. Uh, okay, sad note. So GAKEV wants CFDIOX. This is the uh, prototype chipmunk. 1951. This is the last known record that can be dated of the aircraft. Um, but at some time in 1953 it was scrapped, um, which is a great shame. It was canalised and used as spares for the other um, four Canadian chipmunks. So that was a great shame that it, it didn't survive. So, moving on to the second half then. How am I doing on halves, Greg? Okay, keep talking, he says. Um, so, the chipmunk was celebrated in Canada. They produced a $20 coin, and the gentleman there is Russ Fanick, who at the time was the chief test pilot. The Brits decided to do something a little more adventurous. They thought they'd take two chipmunks and send them around the world, around the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so, let's have a look. Start off here in the UK, out across Western Eastern Europe, all the way across the Russian Federation, up north to Providenia Bay, off across the Bering Strait, Alaska, Canada, and then all the way back up north again to minimise the water crossings, over and around Greenland, and then back home to the UK. And they call it Exercise North Adventure. So, as I've said, it all came about because I wanted to recognise the chipmunk's 50th anniversary, and, and that, I think, reflects the, the affection with which the aircraft was held in the Royal Air Force. But you can't just go to the boss and say, hey, you want to send you a chip on the board. You've got to have a good reason. So they came up with three. These are the old bullet points here. The argument was that it would improve east-west relations. This was just after the end of the Cold War, so that was a noble thing to do. They thought it would promote general aviation, business and social contacts with uh, the, the newly founded Russian Federation. And they thought also it might provide an overland route from Europe to North America instead of having to go around the Atlantic and the perils of that. And uh, if you want to know about the perils of that, pick on Steve Randall at the back there and tell you all about it. Or a southern book. Get on with it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> anyway, we know why they were doing it. It was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the chipmunk. So where do you start? Well, if you head out across Russia, you don't have many airfields. You also have some large expanses of water to cross. So you're not going to get there on these piddly little tanks they've got in there, the fuel tanks, and on, on a two hour, 200 mile, 250 mile duration. So what you need is an auxiliary fuel tank, maybe one that holds about two and a half times as much fuel, and you put it in the back. Take out the back seat, and you put this in the back. And I'm happy to say that I actually have that fuel tank that was in that plane when it went around the world. I've got that in the hangar on the stand and it's looking great still. So this is what gave them a five hour endurance. So the, 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 the world record, although that's not an official world record, the world record for a chipmunk flight was four hours and 55 minutes. So what they used to do, one of the problems they had actually going across Russia is access to avgas. Frequently, they couldn't get avgas, and they would have to go into the local town with jerry cans to fill them up with no gas, and they would put that in the auxiliary fuel tank. They would put avgas in the wing tanks, they'd take off and land on the wing tanks, and they'd cruise on the auxiliary tank. So this is a shot taken just before they uh, left in May 1997. Whoops, hang on. 46 plus 50, doesn't that make 96? So what happened in 96 is they set off and they got as far as Moscow when the Russians turned them around and said, well, there are lots of fires in Siberia and in the Taiga. It's, um, you know, it's, it's basically, it's instrument conditions with all the smoke. 
you can't go through. There's also the idea that perhaps they said that because they didn't have sufficient uh, ab gas at the time to be able to keep the plane still. So they sent them home. But the guys in the RAF were sufficiently enthusiastic about this. They pushed, 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 and they got to go again as you've seen in 97. So this is on the day before they departed with the, the Red Arrows at RAF Cranwell over the Central Flying School. And you'll notice that the chipmunks were painted up in the same colours as the Red Arrows. Remember that. They had a support ship, a uh, Britain Norman Islander, uh, that carried uh, both the, the engineer and the spare chipmunk pilot, uh, plus all of the spares they needed, tools, and also um, barrels of out gas. I'm not sure I like that idea, but that's what they did. So here are the, uh, the intrepid pilots. Sid Hughes, whose name is on the side of this plane because that was primarily the plane he flew. Tony Cowan flew the other chipmunk, which is now in the Royal Air Force Museum uh, in London, and Bill Purchase, whose name is also on 833, and he would hop between the two planes, and so each of these guys would fly two legs, and then Bill would come and spell one of them and spell the other one, that was his two legs done, he'd be back in the island. Uh, it's important to recognise that none of these planes fly without guys on the ground fixing them. And, you know, Pilots get all the glamour, but they actually don't deserve it. Um, Dave Gill was the engineer, and the around the world success is as much his as anybody's. With the fact that he, keep, he kept these two, you know, 1920s technology planes going all the way around the world. And then we've got Tony Severs, who flew the Islander, and uh, Yuri Vostoknikov, who was their minder. He was there as a navigator, but he was there as their minder as well on behalf of the Russian government. But as it turned out, he was a real team member, a real player, and he gave him loads of help and sorted everything out along the way when things got expensive or complicated as they do in big countries like that. So there's the route across uh, Eurasia. Here they are, an unusual couple of visitors to, to uh, Moscow's Shalometyevo. Um, I could go on about this. I actually have a two-hour presentation, but I'll spare you that because you're such nice people sitting there quietly. Um, I'll just show you a few samples that, that show what they had to endure. So here we go, filling the auxiliary tank with what they called largages. The larder being a uh, good old Russian car at the time, but basically it's no gas going in there. Um, not, no real visual aids. In fact, that's why they installed a Garmin. So the RAF actually installed a Garmin in these two chipmunks. I think that the, until the Battle of Britain Memorial flight got them recently, they were the only two chipmunks who ever had a Garmin installed. Um, the Trans Siberian Railway was a helpful navy, just to follow the tracks, but often they were over just plain green forests, nowhere else to go. And bear in mind, because of the paucity of airfields, they often literally had nowhere to go. They got to a point where they had to decide, do we continue, do we go back? And only three times did they ever have to go back. This is to say they weren't a bit nervous by the time they got there. So, somewhat dilapidated uh, control tower in Omsk. Doesn't look quite up to the standard that some we see around here, for sure. Um, and this is uh, Omsk airfield. The grass has got to be 20 centimetres long then, I guess. Uh, but, you know, that was typical. It, it was either long grass or it was one field, there was no grass. Um, and that's a rather sad looking Antonov 12 in the background, which, by the way, the prototype had its first flight on my fifth birthday. Um, and then you built 12,046, which is fewer than the number of chipmunks built. I thought you'd like to know that. This is the grass airstrip. I guess the grass just got fairly brown. They called them grass strips, but a lot of them were just plain dirt. Um, although this picture here does reveal the grass, it's just here on the extreme right. <laughs> um, and Antonov 24, a real workhorse in, in, uh, in, in the Soviet Union and Russia. But this is the kind of thing they had to put up with all the time. And in fact, they, it's not surprising that they had a stone ship on one of the props which needed it to be replaced. Yes, they took a spare for color. Wouldn't you? Another little problem, getting rid of wild ponies. Um, so the wild ponies had to be cleared from the runway. When they came to leave, they got the bill, which included a massive fee for clearing away the wild ponies. And this was the sort of thing that happened all the way. They'd get ridiculous bills 
like, you know, you stop, still follow on the tarmac, we're going to have to clear that up. The fact there's a huge puddle over there, it's totally irrelevant, it's just a way of trying to extort money from them. Usually ended up with lengthy negotiations to bring it down by about a factor of four. Um, Tom Tall's an interesting place they went to, it looks nice and sunny, and of course this was in uh, early June. Uh, but it's actually the coldest inhabited place on the planet. Colder than anywhere, even in Antarctica. So a minus 71.2 Celsius, which I guess would probably make your eyeballs freeze if you open them outside the house. So not recommended in winter. And this was one of the more salubrious accommodations they had, when they called it the Tom Tall Hills, and it was actually barracks. Often they had no running water, or sorry, no hot running water. What, what did run would be a brown colour. Just, you know, not the greatest living conditions. Just another picture here of another ant, ant of operating on grass. Uh, this is Zurianka 9 km strip. It's called Zurianka 9 km strip because it's 9 km from Zurianka strip, which floods in the spring, so they needed another airfield. And then from Zurianka, they had to go sort of northeast up to the Bering Strait, which took them over some of this rather inhospitable looking. Terrain. I mean, I, I really, you know, they, they, they might have had to put a plane down there, they might have had the island to circle around for a long time, but I think they would have been waiting a long time for help. More, more uh, wonderful accommodation. And then when they got to Providenia Bay, the first time they tried to get into Providenia Bay, that was one of the occasions where they turned around halfway and went back to Anadia spent another night there, tried to get the next day, and finally got in with 20 knot fog which is a fairly unusual weather condition, I think. Fog usually tends to stand still. So from there, they set off across the Bering Strait, and this, this is pretty much the classic picture of um, the Around the World trip. Uh, 833, this plane here is the one nearest. Uh, they actually never got to see the Bering Strait because they were 5,000 feet above an undercast, so layer of cloud, they couldn't see anything there. So they arrived in Nome, um, under the stars and stripes, hot running water, coke, steaks, you know, everything seemed normal again, but to them, there was a chance to put on the 10 or 12 pounds they'd lost flying across Russia. So, here we go then, across uh, Alaska, Canada, down to Downsview, uh, which is down here, which is kind of uh, the pilgrimage purpose, I mean, you know, you've got to go to Downsy if you're flying a chipmunk across uh, Canada. So, uh, and then they had to fly way up north to get this minimal water crossing here to Greenland. So, um, to go across Alaska, they end up at uh, AFB Hudson and uh, were surprised themselves to find a squadron of Royal Air Force tornadoes in, but not half as surprised as the tornado guys were to find chipmunks on the field. <laughs> Entering Canada, hey, eh? here we go. And um, funny enough, Dan, weren't we talking about White Horse last night at dinner? And here they are getting into White Horse, and this guy shows up in his, um, what, nine build before this aeroplane here, just completely voluntarily, just shows up to welcome them into Canada, which was a nice thing to do. And it's a great shot, I think, because the background makes it a uh, really uh, high contrast composition. Maintenance, well, you just do it where and when you can, but at least here they've got a hangar to use uh, if they needed it. And they often did find hangars as they came across uh, Canada, rather than just having to pitch down in the open in uh, the Russian Federation. A little bit of excitement here, weather behind them closed in, weather ahead of them closed in, what do you do? Hey, it's Canada. You just find a straight road, that's what they're there for, it's by the street, you land on it, just pull off to the side, and wait for things to get better. And then it's down to you where they had a little welcoming committee, um, a few de Havilland types, Tiger Moth, that's a DH 82, and that's got to be an A or a B model because as you can see it's got the open cockpit. Um, the H 60 Gypsy Moth Beyond. Anybody know what this is? It's not the Havilland, that's for sure. What is it? Thank you, yes. The correct answer is a Harvard. It's not a T6, it's a Canadian built Harvard. And then, of course, if you're in Toronto, you've got to do it. You go and do the, uh, the tourist thing and annoy all the helicopter operators for an hour where they can't operate because the Royal Air Force are taking over the airspace. 
And then on up towards Drawland, uh, at uh, Kyolet, which is, uh, I guess it must be a fairly big strip because um, it's a, an emergency, or was an emergency, space shuttle, emergency landing strip. And I guess they painted it yellow so they could see it from orbit. It's a joke. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, leaving Canada then from Dwarf Island, here they go, off over the wet stuff. They had a good forecast going to, um, God, somebody help me. Steve. Carla Lusowak? Whatever he said. Yeah. It's, it's at the end of Sondres from Fjord. And off they went. Weather came in, very low power base. And again, one of these situations where there's no choice. You've got to go where you're going to go. So they went up Sondrestion, Sondrestron Fjord with a 200 foot overcast, rock each side, and it's a 90 kilometer run. So they were basically flying up there for an hour between the rocks and the cloud with an airfield where there really wasn't a choice, you know, anywhere else to go. And people going around. This was meant to be a picture of the chart showing them going up there, but I think the cloud base came all the way down, so sorry. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. Um, so they make it back to the UK, and this is where they, they landed at RAF Kinloss. What's interesting is this aeroplane in the hangar here. Look at those engine intakes. Don't they look a little bit like the intakes on the comet I showed you early on? Well, this is actually a comet derivative. It's the Hawke Sidley Nimrod. It's got a, basically, they've got another fuselage on top of the original. And, and that served uh, probably until about 10 or 12 years ago. So, again, you know, the comet airliner had one heck of a long career. So, from there, they continued on down to what had always been there. Planned destination, the Royal International Air Tattoo at RAF Fairford. And so you've got here uh, the two chipmunks here and here, and in the background is actually the backup ship. It never was used, but they had a backup ship painted up, ready to go, and they could have dropped everything in that if either one of the two prime ships had gone south on them. So that's about the end of the story, just a few numbers. Um, they flew 66 legs and went to 62 airfields. They flew over 16,000 nautical miles and 170 hours in round numbers of flying time. And it took them 63 days. Um, I love my chipmunk. About 63 days of flying it, I think, would be about three days at least too much. <laughs> when these aircraft were selected, or oh, sorry, when these aircraft got back from this flight and were uh, put out to, to rest by the Air Force, um, you know, they're both of the same era, late 52, early 53. Uh, mine in particular, 15,591 hours and 32,000 plus landings. The other one, modest, only 12,000 hours and 28,000 landings. Today, uh, and that's about all that, that WP962 will ever achieve because it's now in the museum. WP833 these days has about 16,800 hours that it's short of. And um, 33,000 and something hours. Fairly high time. Um, I've gone through this relatively quickly. If you are interested to know more about this story, uh, there's a book which the lovely young ladies are selling over there by the plane. Um, go and have a look at that. And finally, oh, and the proceeds go to charity. I'm just doing this for the sheer end of it. Finally then, um, just a, a couple of adventures I have been fortunate enough to have since um, acquiring this aircraft. The Air Attaché in Washington DC, the British Air Attaché that is, invited the aeroplane up to Washington DC in 2018 for the RAF 100 celebrations. Um, continuing with the Canadian theme, here she is next to the Canadian Lancaster from the Canadian War Plane Heritage Museum at Hamilton. Um, great bunch of guys and uh, operators with only the second uh, airworthy Lancaster in the world. And here we are at the Udvahati uh, Centre of, of Dallas International. So I got to fly my chipmunk into Washington Dallas International, which was a bit of a laugh. It certainly caused a bit of havoc. 
On the way home, um, I stopped off at Oshkosh and I was one of uh, three aircraft which the EAA put together for, for an RAF 100 celebration. So this was uh, one, a picture of one of my classes there and I hope and expect to be flying this afternoon if the show's playing off. Um, and here's a very rare shot. The chipmunk is unarmed, but it's fearless. And here it is, taking on a stick by a head <laughs> Great picture. Um, and that Spitfire is the only Spitfire that's actually been built in Canada. It's being flown there by Dave Hadfield. And finally, I showed you this picture earlier. Um, the Red Arrows visited North America in 2019. And I thought it would be a good idea to get a picture of the chipmunk alongside them again, but they changed their tail scheme. So I figured I'd better change mine, and here's what came up. I'm so impressed with that, I'm going to do it again, actually. It took me a long time to get that lined up. And I'm thankful to the RAF photographer who also took the original picture and got himself in the position to get this. So what's interesting about this picture is that only the aeroplane, the helmet and the flight suit are the same in both pictures. It's a different white-haired old geezer and they're also different halls. They've all been cycled out of eight hours and new ones put in. So that was pretty cool and it's just a part of the continuing heritage with the Royal Air Force. Occasionally I go down the fly where the RAF bring in um, Hercules for parachute training and I'll just fly down there and shot and that always gives them a bit of a surprise there. An RAF chipmunk rolls in. So that's it, I'm done. I'm going to try and get out of here before you can think of any questions. But if you're quick, I'll answer them. But thank you very much for turning up.